Good morning and aloha everybody. My name is Mark Shklov. I am the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea. And uh, today our program is called OMG, it's the <laughs> ODC. And uh, our guest is Bruce Kim, who is the Chief Disciplinary Counsel of the Office of Disciplinary Counsel of the Supreme Court of the State of Hawaii. Uh, and that's a long title, uh, but it's uh, well earned uh, by my friend for over 50 years, uh, Bruce Kim. Uh, and Bruce, welcome to our show. Good to see you. M Mark, thanks so much for having me this morning. And it's great to see you again and, and reminding me that it's been over 50 years. <laughs> <laughs> and as long as I'm not in front of you at the ODC, I guess it's okay because sure. lawyer, lawyers think, you know, when you hear from the ODC, uh, maybe you're in trouble or maybe there's a problem, but maybe tell our, our viewers, what is the ODC, for, first of all? Office of Disciplinary Counsel is an arm of the Hawaii Supreme Court. And basically, there's a board, the Disciplinary Board of the State of Hawaii uh, Supreme Court, which basically administers the Office of Disciplinary Counsel. So in a, way, in a way of describing it, it would be something like we are a special master of the Hawaii Supreme Court, appointed as special masters for the Hawaii Supreme Court in order to prosecute, investigate and prosecute instances of attorney ethical violations. Okay, ethical violations, all right. Now, I'll get into that a, a little bit later, but uh, ethical violations, how do, you, how do you hear about ethical violations or how, how do you, how does that come before the ODC? Well, that's where the whole process starts. And generally speaking, uh, the process starts through complaints that are filed with our office. These are written complaints. They're available at our website. Uh, people complain about their lawyers or other lawyers or the conduct of their lawyers or other lawyers. We also get complaints from lawyers themselves who may be litigating against a particular lawyer and, and file complaints as well. But the vast majority of complaints come from members of the public and generally from clients uh, who are represented by clients by attorneys who they accuse of committing an ethical violation. Okay. And so the ODC is uh, a, a subject to the Supreme Court. It's organized by the Supreme Court, is that right? Correct, by rule. And, and you are the Chief Disciplinary Counsel. Correct. That's the right title I got? Correct. Okay. What do you do? What's, what's your job? And I, I assume you have some lawyers that work under you. Correct. What, what is your job specifically at the ODC? Well, right, I've, I've only been on the uh, chief for about a month now. I was appointed by the disciplinary board on May 16th of this year to become the disciplinary chief. A April or? March 16th. March, March 16th. Correct. So uh, prior to that, I was just a line uh, assistant disciplinary counsel for about a year and a half um, uh, litigating cases uh, on behalf of the agency. So since I've taken over, I've learned that there's a lot of administrative issues that have to be dealt with on a regular basis. It's very time consuming. We also interface with other portions of the bar, including the Supreme Court and the Hawaii State Bar Association, as well as nationally through various organizations, the National Organization of Bar Council and the National Organization of Bar Council State uh, Chiefs. So um, it's a very like a broad, uh, the, the portfolio is very broad. And it deals with ethical complaints. Correct. And you're, you're the head of it, and yes. you get these complaints. Now, what, what gives you the background? What, what is your background to be head of this, this, or, this organization that oversees complaints against lawyers? That's a very good question. People may want to ask that question you know, of me. And uh, uh, as you know, I was in private practice for quite a number of years, approximately 32 years. And during that time, I was pretty much all in civil litigation. I had a wide exposure to different types of litigation involving real property, personal injury, employment law, et cetera. Um, this, this, that particular background was well suited to what I'm doing now because the complaints that we get are, are involving all types, all types of law, all segments of the law practice. In wide variety. Hawaii. Correct. And that would be kind of match your practice of what you did when you were in private practice. Exactly. So it, it was really helped me get adjusted to the kinds of problems that we're seeing um, you know, in the bar today as well as prosecuting these particular violations. It was very helpful. 
And then I had a, a year and a half, a little under over a year and a half of experience as an assistant disciplinary counsel, where I got to see the nitty gritty uh, prosecution of a case from investigation all the way through a hearing. So those experiences really helped me, uh, you know, in terms of the context of what the kind of what kind of work I'm doing right now as the chief. Okay, and and you know, I, I got to say, you. you your, your dad was an attorney, correct? Too, yes. and uh, was very well respected here yes. in our community. Yes. And so you come from a, a, a legal background. Yes. Yeah. And As, and do you feel that that's uh, helped you too? No, absolutely. You know, my father was uh, obviously very influential in my uh, personal and legal career, and uh, he was a great mentor to me. Um, he as well did a number of different types of cases. Um, it, I don't know if m many people know this in the bar, but I think my dad was like the second Korean American attorney licensed in the state of Hawaii. Wow! The first Korean American attorney uh, was Herbert Choi, who was his first cousin. <laughs> and uh, uh, there's a number of Kims in our family actually who became lawyers afterwards. People like Patricia Park and uh, Sean Sean Kim, Gordon Kim. So it's, it's kind of a family affair, a yes. good background that you have. Mm -hmm. Now, the ODC, uh, and, and I was, you know, I was kind of, in a way I was kidding about, you know, lawyers are mm -hmm. afraid when they hear from the ODC, but mm -hmm. it, it's, it's serious, as you say. It's, mm -hmm. it, it, the ODC gets involved when there's an ethical type of complaint. Correct. What is, what is an ethical complaint? I mean, what, sure. are, what are we talking about? What is ethics? What, what, what type of complaints are we talking about that the ODC gets? Uh, just generally, mm -hmm. for th for the audience out there, you know that that's a really an excellent c question, uh, because the legal profession uh, involves at its very core the issue of trust, uh, not not only trust by between the, an attorney and his client, but between the attorney and the court, yeah. as well as the attorney and the public. So um, there's a lot of trust placed in attorneys. So. The system of discipline, I think, evolved over the years uh, since the American judicial system was established. And uh, mostly now, these, that disciplinary function is performed by the actual courts themselves. And there's a Latin term called sui generis. So that term uh, is the basis for the jurisdictional uh, actions that are taken by the various courts throughout our country, both federal and state, to police the practice of law before them. And. Uh, it's a very, um, because of this issue with respect to trust, it's a very heavy responsibility for our office. Obviously, we, we need to make sure that the attorney has uh, their opportunity to be heard, as well as notice of the uh, charges against them. And we have to make sure, uh, under the system that we have here in Hawaii and throughout the country, that we're doing fair by the attorney, as well as the public, the judiciary, and the profession to police our profession. So unlike many professions in, this, in our state and in the country, our profession has the unique privilege of re, uh, disciplining itself. Self, yeah. And that's a, that to me uh, is a very weighty responsibility for me and my office. Really, mm -hmm. yeah, it is because, mm -hmm. uh, and it could bring up, I mean, we gotta trust you. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, we have to trust, you're talking about trust from the lawyer's standpoint, but you have the big responsibility yes. of making sure that everything you do yes. can't be a, pr a problem with trust. Correct. That you have to do the right thing, right? Yeah, that's Correct. a big my, responsibility. Me and my, me and my staff. Yeah. So uh, thanks for reminding me. <laughs> <laughs> how, how many uh, staff staff members do you have? Uh, right now we have. Um, I have a deputy uh, chief and a line assistant disciplinary counsel, and we're process of filling out additional spots. Okay, so you talk about trust. What, within that trust uh, uh, title, mm -hmm. what, what subtitles are there? What, mm -hmm. what type of trust things so, are we concerned with? You know, and I, I, uh, I think this is, a, you know, to finish off your original question, is the fact that all of the ethics, rules of ethics, I think relate back to trust. And this relationship between attorneys, their clients, the public, uh, other attorneys in the court. And in order for a system of justice to function, we have to have that trust with each other. And um, when people violate that trust, that's where the rules of ethics come into play. So it, it might involve things like uh, misappropriating funds from your trust fund, 
a trust fund for the viewers out there are basically funds that are required by rule to be maintained in a separate account and not withdrawn until they're actually earned. So an attorney has an, a, client, a client trust fund and some of the ethical complaints are about taking money out of that when they shouldn't. Is when it? they shouldn't have done it. And um, so the attorney acts as a, a fiduciary and it's in our rule to that, uh, that word, fiduciary, when they hold funds for their clients or third persons in that account. So we were very careful about, and, and the rules are very clear about not taking out money uh, before you earn it and not commingling earned fees in that account um, with the, the, the funds of your clients because there's a host of problems that could arise by those, that type of conduct. And um, so that's an example of the uh, type of rules we administer, again, based on the issue, uh, you know, the overarching concern about maintaining this trust and why it's so critical, especially for our profession, who is self-regulated. So I, I can see that clients would be very concerned about money mm -hmm. and the money that they've entrusted to their lawyer to put in their account mm -hmm. and not take it out before it was due. Right. I can see that's a, a big, big concern. Mm -hmm. Are there, were there any, any other type, of, I mean, what other type of client trust issues arise? And then you also men mentioned attorney complaints sometimes. What, uh, mm -hmm. give me some examples of that. Too. Sure. Um, again, taking off on the uh, issue of trust, uh, we have complaints um, involving things like conflicts of interest. Mm, and again, okay. this is the trust between the attorney and his, his or her client right. that when they go to the attorney, they believe, and hopefully the attorney is acting in their, that client's sole interest and not uh, the interest of some other person or third party. So there's a very extensive rules in the rules of uh, professional conduct dealing with conflicts of interest. And obviously, if you retain an attorney to represent you, you have to trust that attorney is going to be representing you and not somebody else. And maybe he had a prior relationship or some, somehow he knows the other person and you, the client wants to be assured that the attorney is working just for him. Absolutely. It's, it's the duty of loyalty. And, and then also the conflicts can arise with the attorney he, him or herself have conflicts with the client because they have interests in other clients. They may have business or financial interests that may conflict with their client. So there are also rules within the rules of professional conduct dealing with transactions between attorneys and clients as well. I see. So a client engages an attorney sometime during that engagement mm -hmm. has a question about trust, either funds or some conflict of interest, and then they, they send it on to, to you. To ODC. To the ODC. Now, I want to go into the procedures after our break, but mm -hmm. what type of complaints do attorneys make about attorneys mm -hmm. to you? Um, I, I can't say categorically that the, it's limited exclusively to certain kinds of complaints because there's complaints uh, all, all kinds of complaints, but uh, a lot of attorney complaints, attorney versus attorney complaints arise from disputes that have uh, arisen from litiga ongoing litigation or past litigation. So they're already the fighting correct, with, with each other Yes, and they get angry about something the other attorney does and says that's unethical. Right, and, 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 and we're obligated to investigate those complaints as well because some of them may be well, well founded. I see. And mm -hmm. then you, you would take in the complaint from the attorney or the client and proceed further on, on what, what has to be done. We would perform our normal investigation. And you know, on one other point, and again, this issue of trust, actually courts need to trust attorneys too. And um, a number of the rules within the rules of professional conduct deal with attorneys' relationships with courts. For instance, there's a rule against lying to a court, uh, yeah. which is obviously a no-brainer. Right. Uh, there's you, you hope. A, yeah, you would hope. <laughs> you would hope. Um, there's rules about not disrupt, disrupting a tribunal. And we had a case on, on that just last year uh, that I was involved in, in where uh, an attorney uh, representing one of the parties to, a, to a, a temporary restraining order proceeding went up to the pro se petitioner and uh, started to accost this woman in a very a loud tone of voice and used repeatedly 
uh, vulgar uh, sexual slurs against this woman. And I think that was in the news also. I hope so. <laughs> yeah, I hope so. <laughs> well, let me, I, I want to take a break right now, and then mm -hmm. we'll come back and talk about the actual procedure. Sure. Okay, so thanks. Thank you. My name is Calvin Griffin, host of Military in Hawaii, which airs here on Think Tech Hawaii every Friday at 11 a.m. Please join us. We'll be talking about issues concerning our military, veterans community, and other related issues that concern all of us. Hi, I'm Stephen Philip Katz. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist in Hawaii, and I do a show called Shrink Wrap Hawaii, where shrinks and sometimes other people come on and talk about the art and science of psychology, talking to people, relationships. Uh, so if you are curious about shrinks and want to be shrunk and don't know where to go, tune into Shrink Wrap Hawaii. All right? All right. Welcome back to Think Tech Hawaii Law Across the Sea uh, with Bruce Kim, the Chief Disciplinary Counsel of the ODC. OMG, it's the ODC, uh, and that's title is all my fault, so I apologize uh, to you, Bruce, but it's good to have you here. Good to have you. Thank, thank you for telling us about the ODC, what it does. It's a pleasure. My pleasure, Mark. Now, uh, we, we talked about different types of complaints that you get. You, you get complaints about uh, from clients about trust funds or maybe conflicts of interest, and you get complaints from attorneys and I, I, I get the gist that a lot of it happens during litigation and during a fight in court lawyers can get pretty tied up and angry at times and they may fi find that things that the opposing party does, the opposing attorney does, mm -hmm. they, they don't like yes. and they report to you. Okay, yes. so uh, I, get it. I get it. You get complaints from clients, you get complaints from attorneys, mm -hmm. various topics all to do with trust, which I, I like you, the way that you can categorize that. I mean, yeah, it all has to do with trust, mm -hmm. really, and, and the trust of an attorney by the court and by the client and by other counsel. Mm -hmm. What happens? You get a complaint, and, you, and I, you, you mentioned that I think that the forms for complaints are on your website. Correct. odchawaii.com. Okay. I'm a client or an attorney. I want to file a complaint. Mm -hmm. What What's the whole procedure to do that. What okay. happens? All right, it starts by uh, downloading our form, filling it out and signing it, uh, attaching whatever relevant documents uh, you think is uh, necessary, sending it into our office. When we, do, when we receive a complaint in our office, there's an initial intake done. The complaint is reviewed by several different parts of our office. When, when, I'm sorry, when you say parts of your office, mm -hmm. I'm going to stop you every so long. Who, what, mm -hmm. what are the parts of your office? What Generally, it's reviewed by the legal staff including me as chief. Okay. So uh, after the uh, decision is made to go forward on the complaint, so some of them are, are just not uh, within our jurisdiction. And I know people m might be confused about the viewers mm -hmm. might be concerned about that, but we only have power to act within on cases that are within our jurisdiction. For instance, we can't, we don't have power to act on ethical violations that might have occurred in another state unless it was committed by a Hawaii lawyer. Um, and we don't have power to act uh, in complaints against judges, for instance. There's another body uh, for complaints against judges. So those are the type of issues dealing with jurisdiction that we're also uh, aware of. And, um, but after the review is done and the decision is decided, is made to move forward, it, it's assigned to the investigator. The investigator will conduct a thorough investigation. Okay, let me stop you right now. You, mm -hmm. So the ODC has its own investigator? Staff, yes. I see. And they're on staff? Yes. And they're dedicated to the ODC? Correct. Okay. They work for the ODC. Pr presently, there's three of them, including a supervising investigator. Wow. And that's a recent change and a very very good change for our office that we have a supervising investigator. Okay. So, so what, what does the investigator do? Uh, they, they will generally, uh, the first step is to contact the uh, respondent. We refer to them as the respondent. The attorney who the cl uh, complaint is made against is the respondent. We will send the respondent a copy of the complaint and ask for a written response. There may be specific issues that we want them to address. That would be in the cover letter sent to the respective attorney. And does the attorney that's the respondent, does, does that attorney get the whole complaint, get yes. everything? Yes. And does the investigator uh, or anybody on your staff talk to the complainant beforehand, or do they just 
take it and evaluate and send it out? Is there some sort of interaction? Yeah, there is a sort of screening process done by the investigative staff. After they review the initial complaint, they may contact the respondent directly and ask them just informally, what, what's this about? Uh, they may contact the complainant because they think that there's more information the complainant may have, but they haven't provided it yet to ODC. Okay. So we may send out a separate inquiry to them, either telephonically, by email, or in writing, asking them to please supplement their complaint with additional information, specific additional information that we need to go forward. So at that point, you're trying to gather the facts. Correct. So gather the facts. Again, okay. we're not rushing to judgment here. We're taking our time, and we're going step by step through this process. And even uh, at that level, some complaints are dismissed hmm. because after we talk to the respondent or the complainant won't cooperate with us anymore and we don't get the essential information, there's no point in going forward. And then you, you advise the parties? Yes, that? in writing. Okay, now let's say it goes forward. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what happens next? You got your investigator. What does the, what does the, the investigator will go step by step through the complaint, uh, in, uh, interview or communicate with relevant witnesses uh, as I said, the, the initial first step is to send the complaint to the respondent attorney mm -hmm. and ask for their detailed respo written response to the complaint. Can the attorney say, hey, I'm not going to answer those questions. I take the fifth or so something like that. Um, th that's a good question because we're dealing with that issue right now. There's a, actually a Supreme Court rule called 2.12a. Uh, we can ask for an interim suspension if the attorney refuses to cooperate with their office. It's also a separate ethical violation for an attorney not to cooperate with our office so um, during the course of an investigation. I see. Um, that's why, you know, one of my pitches this morning is that when attorneys do receive a letter from ODC, they should respond. Uh, the more they dialogue with us, the better it's going to be for them. But saying no or throwing it in the uh, circular file is probably not a good idea. It just aggravates the situation okay. in, in most cases. And it's not going to go away. Correct. Okay. Uh, we don't need their cooperation to proceed, <laughs> you know. And, and again, like I said, it's a separate ethical violation to not cooperate with okay. our office. All right. So you do the you do the investigation. What what happens? What happens next? You're gathering facts, gathering more information, talking to the parties. What happens next? Correct. Um, so the, eventually, the investigation is concluded. Uh, at that stage, again, the complaint may be dismissed for lack of uh, sufficient evidence. In our, in our office, the burden that's been placed on us is to prov prove each of the allegations by clear and convincing evidence, which is not exactly beyond a reasonable doubt for the viewers out there, but it's not the mere preponderance standard in most civil cases. So we have a heavier burden to prove in these cases. That's why it really behooves us to take our time in these investigations and make sure the case is thoroughly vetted at all levels in the complaint process. Okay. And, and if you dismiss a case and the client or the complainant thinks, well, that was wrong. Mm -hmm. Can they do something about that? Uh, they, they could ask for the, that decision to be reconsidered at that stage of the proceedings. And that would be by you or by the Supreme by Court or by the board or by who? It would be done by a reviewing board member. I see. So, okay. And then, all right, so you complete the investigation. Correct. You uh, reach a decision to proceed. Correct. You, you think there's an ethical violation. Mm -hmm. you, you've concluded that. Yes. And, and right, that you you made the conclusion. Correct. Is that within the board? That, that's that's the, that's when they decide to go forward. That's what they've concluded. Is correct. That, is that so a correct? The, the way that the way that uh, uh, ends up is that after the attorney receives the investigative report, and again, these are in our our board rules. Mm -hmm. These procedures are in our board rules. Uh, the case is sent out for review. Uh, by a reviewing board member of the board of uh, disciplinary board of the Supreme Court of the State of Hawaii. That reviewing board member performs a really important function in this process because up to that point, it, it had been handled all entirely within the ODC. Mm -hmm. But now a member of the board uh, reviews the uh, report as well as the evidence that's been presented and generally a copy of the proposed petition for discipline and makes a decision based on their review of the matter whether to proceed or whether to dismiss. Okay, so that, and that's one board member. One board member making that decision, and that, Correct. that I guess that that goal is you can have somebody that's apart from the ODC yes. that governs the ODC takes a look at it, and if they have any questions, can they come back and ask you yes. or talk to you about it? Okay, yeah. they can return it to us and ask us to open the, reopen the investigation because of certain things that the reviewing board member um, catches. Okay, so again, this it's a step by step. Step-by-step -step process, 
and uh, there's no rush to judgment, so to speak, is carefully reviewed at each one of these steps because it's an important decision, yeah. ultimately, the decision to prosecute. And it affects the livelihood and the future of, of individuals Correct. Uh, who are lawyers in the state of Hawaii. Right, but most importantly, the decision to prosecute is pr to protect the public. Protect the public, okay. Yes. I'm glad you told me that. Yes. Okay, so that that's the ultimate goal. That is the sole goal of our office, is to protect the public, protect the integrity of the profession, and protect the integrity of the courts. Okay. Uh, m many of the respondents believe that it's there to punish them, but no. The Supreme Court has said in multiple jurisdictions, including the ABA, has said the purpose of disciplinary action is to protect the public. Okay. Let's say, what happens next then? Uh, you, you got a complaint that has been approved by a board member. What's the next procedure? Then, uh, once we obtain approval by the reviewing board member to proceed with prosecution, uh, we generally send out what's referred to as a 20-day letter to the individual respondent with, together with a copy of the proposed complaint. Again, this is another step, another break, so to speak, in the process to allow the respondent attorney another chance to respond to these claims. And then ultimately you would have type, some type of hearing or a that's resolution what, of some way? That's where it's going. And, and um, during that 20-day period of time, uh, information is given to the respondent attorney as well about the voluntary settlement conference process, which is, again, outside of the normal uh, disciplinary proceeding. It's, it runs parallel to the disciplinary proceeding, but it's another opportunity for the for the uh, attorney in our office to divert this away from formal hearing. And maybe reach some sort of a settlement and conclusion that doesn't involve bringing in a formal hearing before the board. Is correct. That, is that correct? Correct. And okay. oftentimes it, it, run, it, it works out in a, in a situation, it's a win-win situation for the respondent and for our office, as well as the public. Okay. Now, we, we are actually coming to the end of our program. I don't believe that. <laughs> And I'd just like to ask, you know, I'd like you to just go back and give some advice to attorneys. Uh -huh. you know, when an attorney hears from the ODC, what, what should we do? What, mm -hmm. what should the, you know, what is the uh, ODC's position and what, as attorneys, should we do? Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think um, in the brief time that I've been at, at the office and now as chief, you know, I, I really want to reach out to lawyers in, in our bar. Uh, our bar, I believe, is very, uh, you know, ethical in the sense that, uh, you know, we, we try to do the right thing and we, we do have a lot of spirit for each other. But the, the best thing to do is not to ignore any communications you get from the ODC. The best thing is always to take the time to respond. I understand that it's sometimes very frightening. It could be frightening. Uh, but the best thing is to try to reach out to our organization and get in communic establish a really good working relationship with the investigator and or the prosecuting attorney. And thank you for talking to us and reaching out to us and being, being with us today. And we'll have to come back and talk about more specific cases at some point. I hope you'd be willing to do that. That's my pleasure, Mark. Thank okay. you for having me. Thank you. Thank you.